here to, today to talk to you about long neck dinosaurs and how their body size has affected their biology. And so maybe I, sh uh, maybe I will start by thanking Myron and the physics department for inviting me because it's provided me an opportunity to really drill down into some questions that I've been interested in, I've been touching on for a long time, but I haven't had the time and uh, because of other research interests, including the snake that ate the dinosaur, to really, um, <coughs> uh, really drill, drill down into them. And so today, I'm going to be talking about these animals that were the largest organisms ever to have walked on the earth, sauropod dinosaurs. And walk on the earth they did, we know, because they left an abundant record of footprints, which is what you're looking at on the screen here. You're looking at a little boy, three-year-old boy from 1941, sitting in a sauropod footprint. There's 18, just to give you a sense, there's 18 gallons of water in that footprint. It's not quite all the way full, full up. And so looking at footprints like this gives us a real visceral sense for how big these animals were. Um, and in fact, so dinosaurs have long been fascinating. This is a picture from 1905. This isn't even the first episode of sort of dinomania. We think of dinosaur, dinosaur mania as being sort of 1993 vintage when Jurassic Park came out. But there was dinomania before that. This is 1905 when Diplodocus was unveiled in London. And you know, I thought a lot, as you can imagine, as someone working on dinosaurs, why they're interesting to people. They're sort of super heroic in their feats of great size, and they surpass us in so many ways that they're fundamentally interesting. And I'll talk today about why I think they're fundamentally interesting from a research perspective. One thing that I've also thought about is maybe why the opposite direction in scale isn't somehow quite as exciting. Maybe it is for some people, but maybe you know, not for everybody. And so we're looking here at a, a blastula. It's a ball of cells of a developing organism within the eye of a needle. And maybe one of the reasons that smaller scales aren't quite as exciting from in sort of a visceral way is because we've been there. We start out small and we get big, but dinosaurs have done that and gone past us. And what I want to talk to you about today are some of the consequences, or to get you thinking about the consequences of being big, what it means to be big. There are certainly advantages to being big. You have access to resources that small organisms don't have. You have a wider range. Uh, you're, in some ways, you're free from predators if they're not big enough to take you down. But then there are some real negatives that are associated with it. From an ecological standpoint, populations tend to be less dense. Even if they are more widely spread, they tend to be lower in number. And it takes longer to turn over those populations. So generation times are longer. And then there are some physical constraints that are associated with that, which is what I want to talk about now. But um, maybe first we can think about how size has played out over the history of life. And so what you're looking at here is a time scale. Um, and you're looking at the Phanerozoic. It's just part of Earth history. It's the last half billion years. So at the left here, you can see 500 million years. And at the right, you can see zero. And what's measured on the y-axis is a, an estimate. It's a, a measure of size, biovolume, going from 10 to the negative 2. So these are powers of 10, 10 to the negative 2, all the way up to 10 to the 12. And one of the things that you'll recognize, <clears throat> 10 to the negative 2, you're, we're talking about cubic millimeters. And so a millimeter is about the size of a wrinkle, or, or the, sorry, the ridge on your fingerprint. And if you divide that into hundredths and then make a cube out of it, that's about where you are with 10 to the negative 2. And if you go up to 10 to the negative 6, you're at a liter. Sorry, 10 to the 6, you're at a liter. And so at the beginning of the Phanerozoic, body size ranged from about 10 to the negative 2 to about 10 to the 6, or 8 orders of magnitude, 8 powers of 10. <coughs> As we go forward in time to today, the bottom on body size hasn't really gone up or dropped down. It's more or less stayed the same. But what has changed is the ceiling on body size. It's gone up. And so if we had organisms um, <clears throat> that were at about a liter in volume at the beginning of the Phanerozoic, by the time we get to today, we have organisms that are a million liters large, like the blue whale. And so size has gone up over time. Now let's think about what that might mean in terms of physical properties. I'm sorry that the edge of the screen is cut off a little bit here on the middle one. But we can think about this square cube rule. You've all, I'm sure, heard of this or have thought of it. Um, that is, as we change in size from small to large without changing shape, interesting things happen to lengths versus areas versus volumes. 
as we get larger geometrically, that is without changing shape, our volumes increase disproportionately fast compared to areas and compared to lengths. So the volume, because it's a measure of length times width times height, goes up to the third power. Areas go up by the square and lengths go up by the one. And so we have this fundamental issue that can arise as we get bigger if we change nothing else, that we get a lot heavier very quickly compared to our surface, compared to our areas. And so if we're scaling geometrically, we can expect lengths to more or less be proportional to lengths, lengths to be proportional to maths, math to the one-third power, and areas to be proportional to mass to the two-thirds power. That can have some beautiful effects. And I, I don't know if you noticed, it was quite loud in here, but before I had some music playing, I had a string quartet playing, and one of the reasons that these instruments sound so beautiful and sound so beautiful together relates to their surface area to volume ratio. That is, these instruments are more or less similar in shape but different in size. And if we can imagine the music that's being played on them as a vibration that's resonating within a chamber uh, and resonating through a surface, we have a surface area and volume situation that changes as we go from small to big. And so the distinction in sound is due to those surface area volume problem issue. Now, if we look at this rogues gallery of um, human specimens, we're looking here uh, at the smallest example of a human male, at least recently, and the largest example that we can think of in recent history, and a few uh, athletes in between to fill it out. Um, First thing I'll mention is that height is normally distributed within humans. That is, we have a bell-shaped curve with a mean for males at about 175, depending on which country you're in, 175 centimeters. For females, it's lower than that. It's 160-something uh, centimeters. And so if we think about average height, it's about right here, this dashed line that you can see. And Lionel Messi, greatest player living, um, my, my opinion. Uh, <laughs> is about average in height, okay? And as we go up, you might notice that um, height goes up at a certain rate. You might even notice just by looking at the numbers I put there, but weight goes up faster. So uh, in terms of these humans, which are not geometrically similar, that is, Vern Troyer is shaped differently than Robert Wadlow, if you scaled him up it wouldn't look the same. So there's some shape differences. But if we look at height against weight, height is increasing, um, our weight is increasing to the square of height. And so if you think about it, Yao Ming is more than 300 pounds. Robert Wadlow was 450 pounds the last time they weighed him, which was not right around the time that he died. The organisms that are closest, that are closer or even below average in height, are the ones that are capable of the most incredible athletic feats. So there's a relationship between athleticism and size, okay? Um, this is almost an unfair comparison because Michael Jordan is really an exception. To be that athletic at that size is something that we haven't seen before or since. Um, someone like Messi, however, being as small as he is, is more reasonable for him to be acrobatic and athletic. And in fact, the, uh, the greatest gymnasts and greatest acrobats tend to be below average in size. Okay, so here's... Um, Gabby Douglas at a meter and a half, so she's less than five feet tall and she's less than 100 pounds. Okay, why am I telling you this? Why do we care? Well, one of the reasons this is is because, you know, the, I'm supporting a, vol a weight that's based on my volume, so it's a, it's a length times a length times a length type feature. What's supporting me and what's moving me are my muscles and bones, and muscles and bones, are, their strength is proportional to their cross-sectional areas. So as we get larger, if nothing else changes, we end up having to support proportionately more and more and more weight for the same amount of bones and muscle strength. And that's something that can get big organisms into trouble. <clears throat> but lest you think that we're prisoners of this geometric scaling, there are these evolutionary workarounds. There's ways that we can get around this square cube rule or the square cube problem, where that evolutionarily we can circumvent this. And here are the four that I can think of uh, with little examples. And so one is by changing shape. And I'm giving you an example of the villi of the intestine here. And so let's say 
The intestine is a pipe that goes through our body. It's extracting across the surface. It's extracting uh, energy across the surface. As you get bigger, you have more volume to feed for proportionally less surface area of that pipe. One way to get around that is to change the shape of the pipe and make it um, have these villi and these smaller structures on the villi to get to increase surface area. Okay, so that's one way. Another thing that organisms do is they have allometric growth. That is, certain dimensions of the, of the structure can grow faster than other dimensions. So a big, you might imagine, a big animal, one strategy could be that they grow proportionately greater diameter bones. So that's what you can see here. This is something that Galileo, this is in fact a figure from Galileo. This is something that people have been thinking about for a long time. Another thing we can do is we can change material properties. That is, that the materials that those structures are made of can be made more springy or more stiff, depending on the needs of the organism. And what you're looking at here, of course, is a wishbone. And you know that on Thanksgiving, one of the fun things to do is to try to break it. One of the reasons it's tough to break is because it has a lot of elastic material within it. Right? And it's not evolutionary engineered to be on your plate at Thanksgiving. It's evolutionarily <laughs> engineered to be a spring. And so these are structures that fit in between the shoulder blades. Right? And when the wing comes down, the spring gets opened up and it gets bent. The elastic gets put in tension. And then it comes back and gives energy back into the system. So it gets compressed and extended and acts as a spring to conserve energy. So that's a material property that saves on the power output of a bird. We can also think of behavioral adaptations that might allow for us to get around surface area to volume problems. As you start out young, you're small, you have a lot of surface area for your volume. That's good in some ways and bad in other ways. A lot of surface area means that you lose, you radiate heat very quickly. And so organisms can huddle together. So if you've raised guinea pigs or mice or anything, you know that they make these little stacks together and they can conserve their heat using this behavioral trick. And so there's workarounds for the surface area problem. So we're not prisoners of geometric scaling. And so what I want to focus on today is how sauropods did it. Which of those, if you know, one or many of those tricks, evolutionary tricks, sauropods used to get around the fact that they are living at an extreme, which I'll talk about in just a second. And this is something that I've thought about for a long time. And it's something that, you know, I confronted way back in 1993 for the first time when I was working at this site. This is in Niger, in Africa. And this is a, <clears throat> the site, the excavation site of Jobaria, this animal that you can see here at the bottom left. It's a sauropod dinosaur. And when you're sitting there trying to collect these organisms, you realize how gigantic they are. I've got, so if you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see the humerus. That's this bone right here. This is the same bone. This is a cast of the very bone we excavated back in 1993. It's, um, you'll see it again a little bit later in the talk, and you can come up and look at it later if you want to, and we can talk about it. But you get a quick sense for how big these animals are and what they're facing in terms of the, the uh, surface area to volume ratio problem. But first, let's provide, I want to provide you a little bit of context, what dinosaurs are. So dinosaurs are reptiles. Right? They're large terrestrial reptiles. And they are closely related to birds and crocodiles. They're called archosaurs. And the, the dinosaurs, except, except for birds, which are their living representatives, are restricted to the Mesozoic. Okay? From about, they appear about 230 million years ago, and they go extinct, most of them, about 65 million years ago. And so the Mesozoic is this, um, you can see over here on the screen better, this era that begins and ends and is interrupted with these mass extinction events. And this last ex mass extinction event is the one that wiped out all the dinosaurs except for birds. And if we think about sauropods in the context of dinosaurs in general, looking at the dinosaur family tree, you can see that dinosaur sauropods are sort of going from 12 to 3 o'clock. There they uh, represent about 20% of dinosaur diversity. I tell you that because that's to, in a way to tell you that they're hugely successful animals. So even if they are enormous in size, they're very successful. They last throughout the entire time the dinosaurs are around. They occupy all the continental land masses. They are found on Antarctica even. Okay? And also another thing to think about from this diagram is that you can see the sauropod body plan over here in some of these silhouettes. They're quadrupedal, they're large, they have these um, columnar limbs and a long neck and a long tail. But they evolved from an animal 
that was small, bipedal, and carnivorous. And so this dinosaur ancestor is about a meter long. Sauropods are at the extreme of terrestrial body size for everything, and they're at the extreme of body size for reptiles in general. So there's no aquatic animal that's even, that's large, aquatic reptile that's larger than a sauropod. And so here you can see the extremes. This is the smallest living reptile, and it's an adult. It's a dwarf chameleon on the tip of a match. And then this is, it isn't the largest sauropod, it's a sauropod. It's 22 meters long. And so if you've got really good eyes in the front, you can see that I put a little dot here. That's the dwarf chameleon to scale. And so if you wanted to make, you know, to sort of create the length of a sauropod using chameleons, you'd have to line up a thousand of them in a row. If, on the other hand, you wanted to paint the sauropod with chameleons, you'd have to use a million of them. And if, like a gumball machine, you wanted to fill the sauropod's volume with chameleons, you'd have to use a billion of them. That's how different their surface areas, their volumes, and their lengths are. And note that they're made from the same materials. Chameleons are supporting their body weight with bones and muscles that are the same kinds of bone and muscle that dinosaurs are using. So they have the same stuff that they have <clears throat> at, at their uh, disposal. We can also think, so this is a, you can think of this as a phylogenetic size range. We can also think of the ontogenetic or the developmental size range. And so this is the, um, this is actually taken from, this is a picture taken from the exhibit that uh, Myron was referring to at the beginning when he introduced me. This is this, that's the snake. I've cropped most of it out because it's um, not the subject here. But this hatchling is about half a meter long. It looks very much like, an, it's not exactly the same shape as an adult, but it is similar. And so when they appear on the planet, when they first appear, they're half a meter long. They grow to be 22 meters long. That's a 40-fold change in body size. So that's really an amazing transformation that these organisms have to go through. And one of the questions is how they did it. So we're at the beginning here going to talk about their limb bones, how they supported their bodies on these limbs. How did they get around it, uh, the surface area, the volume problem? The first thing I want to say about limbs is that we need to think about limbs in sort of an evolutionary perspective. And limbs. Uh, appeared about 350 or more million years ago in aquatic organisms. That's a whole other story that we can talk about some other time, but they appeared first in aquatic organisms. And you and me, Ichthyostega and the sauropod all have the same pattern for the limb bones of the arms and of the legs. That is, we have a one, two, many pattern. That is, you have one bone here, two bones there, and a bunch of bones there. The number of bunch of bones differs wildly within uh, vertebrates, at least for the wrist bones and ankle bones. But in the hind limb, you have the same thing, one too many. And so as you go from proximal, that is close to the body, to distal in the limb, you go from having fewer to more elements that tend to be from longer to shorter. So you have a long bone, a slightly shorter pair of bones, and then a much shorter set many of many bones. And <clears throat> like ichthyostega, the limb for a sauropod is made from bone. And if we want to know something about the, the, what the capabilities of animals are, we have to know something about the physical parameters that are the physical properties of their, the structures they're made of. And so we can do that. And this is a way that we do, that we can measure bone strength. And so this on the right-hand side is a tensometer. So you can imagine it's a device that pulls while measuring the amount of pull that it's doing, the amount of force that it's, um, that it's imposing upon a bone sample of a given cross-sectional area. Okay? And this little couple here, it becomes deflected as the bone gets stretched, and we can measure how much deflection it's doing. So we can measure the amount of force, we know the cross-sectional area, and we know the amount of deformation or deflection. And so we can develop as we, you know, we can develop a, a profile like this which measures the stress, which is the force divided by the area, against the strain, which is the change in length over the original length of that material. And we can see that there is this straight part of the, uh, of the curve wherein we have a more or less constant um, 
slope. That is, the stress versus the strain or the stiffness remains constant. This is characteristic of various materials. We can say what the characteristic stiffness is of, for instance, bone, um, as we can for other materials. You might also know that there's a deflection up here that happens. That's when you add in just a little bit more force and you get a huge deflection or a huge change in the length. And that's, oops, I'm sorry. That's when we have failure. Okay, failure is at about here. For bones, that's about 100 to 200 megapascals. And we can also measure in living animals. We can have them do what they do for a living. They can run them around. We can have horses run around a track. And we can put strain gauges on their bones and measure how much strain they're actually experiencing. And so we know where their locomotor stresses lie. And we can look at the difference between those two. And we can see what the factor of safety is that organisms are operating under. There's usually quite a good safety factor of between one and four for um, terrestrial vertebrates. Now, here we're looking at the biggest and the smallest femora that I know of in the sauropod realm. I'm going to um, show you one that hasn't been described yet. This is a new dwarf. It's an adult. It's a new dwarf sauropod from Jordan. It's from the end of the dinosaur era, and it's quite small. It's not so much bigger than my femur. And it's roughly the same size as this one over here. So the smallest adult femur is roughly the size of Vern Troyer, as it turns out, and the largest one is almost the same height as Yao Ming. I don't know why that is. I don't think that's an evolutionary principle we need to think about, but it's a convenient way of conveying to you how big these animals were. Now, if we think back to the, the stress and strain curve and the failure um, profile that I just gave you, this femur would fail in compression if it were shortened about five centimeters or the length of your thumb, roughly. And so if this 2.3 meter long if, um, structure was shortened just five centimeters, it would fail in compression. And if you could potentially load it in compression to that degree, because, or, because bones like this tend to fail other ways before they fail in compression. They tend to fail in something like bending or buckling before that. But one thing this allows us to do when we have these two bones next to each other is to look at how they compare. And so if we scaled up the small one to the size of the big one, you might notice something surprising. If I've been telling you that weight increases disproportionately fast as surface areas, you might expect that the bigger animal will have a proportionately bigger cross-sectional area. But in fact, that's not true. It's sort of a strange pattern that we see within dinosaurs. And it's something that we actually see within mammals too. And um, if we look at the uh, length of, this is a femur or the thigh bone. We look at how the length of these bones changes compared to their, uh, some characteristic diameter. They scale almost with isometry. That is, the diameter of the bone doesn't get much bigger than the proportional increase in the size or the length of the femur. And so saurop sauropods and mammals, as it turns out, don't appear to just grow their bones fatter to support a bigger weight. So they must be doing something else. So they're not using, apparently not using allometry. Um, I'll talk about these other ways that sauropods get around it. We'll talk about shape changes, some material property changes, and maybe some behavioral changes. And so you're looking here at the um, femur, sorry, the, the forelimb, I should say, of Jubaria. That's the animal that I showed you in the excavation. And we did some uh, photogrammetry and some scanning on it. And um, Adam Rondry from our museum put it together in this nice animation. And one of the things that you notice is that we've got it oriented in a columnar fashion. And that's because the shape of the bones and the shape of the articular surfaces tells us that it must be that way. Bone, animals that are in a more crouched posture have different shaped bones. Now let's think about why having this kind of posture might be good. And well, first of all, let me say it's widespread. That is, all sauropods have columnar posture that we know of. There are no sauropods that don't have it. So if we go to the Berlin Museum and you see Dicreosaurus, this wonderful mount here, the limbs are straight when they're in contact with the ground. Similarly with Brachiosaurus, the limbs are straight when they're in contact with the ground. Why is that so? Well, one of the things that we can think about is that squatting or doing squats is really difficult. And so the more bending that we do when we're supporting a load, 
the longer the moment arm that load has to act on our joints. And so the more muscular force we have to exert to counter that. That works for weightlifting. It also works for, for body support. Okay? And so it gets easier as we stand up to this point. This is not as difficult because, I mean, it's difficult for different reasons. It's difficult because there's a tipping issue here. But it's not difficult, as difficult, because the line of um, the, the ground reaction force that's acting against is in line with where the weight is. And this weight can be supported by bone in compression, which bones are good at doing. It gets much harder when you're doing this. And this is another it's an excellent way to sit. If you've been to certain places, you'll see people sitting like this all the time because this bone is loaded in compression. And all of, almost all the body weight is sitting on top of it by virtue of its, the knees being in the armpits there. OK, so squatting is, squats are difficult. And so columnar loading means that the bones can be loaded more in compression than in bending. We also will notice that if we look not at the whole limb, but the individual elements of the limb, limb curvature goes away in sauropods. And so here, over on the right hand, on the left hand side are non-sauropods. And on the left hand side, on the right hand side, we see sauropods. We're looking at thigh bones in internal view. That is, if we took, well, this is a humerus, but if I took it and I held it up like this, and then I held it up this way, you would see that there's very little curvature. If I held up a humerus of a different organism, you would see there's not only curvature um, sort of in those planes, but there's also twisting. And that's gone away in sauropods. And so you can imagine that if the, the load passes through from joint surface to joint surface, by having this bend, you have a bending moment that's imposed on those limbs, and less so in this animal. So bending is reduced. Another thing that sauropods do that's pretty neat with their limb bones is they, they develop these e eccentric cross-sectional areas. And so here you're looking at uh, an animal that's called Saturnalia. It's an um, ancient remote ancestor of sauropods. It's much smaller. There it is to scale over in the corner. And you can see that it's got that curvature I was referring to. But also if we look at the cross-section, the shape of the cross-section, it's circular. Sauropods, on the other hand, have this elliptical cross-section. That's, we think, because the femur is loaded over here. This is the femoral head. This is where it hits the, this is where it articulates with a hip socket. And so the loading is eccentric. And so there's a bending mode imposed in this direction. And more of the material of the femur has been put in line to resist that bending moment. Okay? And so if you're, if you need to visualize that, because I've just said they're kind of columnar in posture, how can you have eccentric loading on a column? Imagine this as either a column or as a wall end on. If we load that wall right in the middle, like if you're standing right in the middle of it, this wall, the, if you took a cross section from A to B, you'd be looking at compressive stress that was equally distributed across A and B. As we move over, if we move that load progressively farther and farther to the left, and we get to this panel here where the load is placed far to the left, this side of the wall or the column is being put in compression, and that side is being put in tension. And so it's acting like a beam. And how do beams work? So this little cartoon is meant to show you um, a cantilevered beam. And so you have a fixed point here. And you can think of this as a, a weight on top of an object with a certain stiffness. That's E, a certain thickness. And this weight is placed a certain distance along the plank. And so you can imagine the deflection of a beam is related to the weight that's put on it and the amount of, of the material that's resisting it. So the, the load that's put on it has to do with how heavy the thing is and where it's placed. Obviously, if you're closer to here, there's going to be less deflection than if you're over here. So this moment arm is important. The load is important. What resists it is the thickness of the beam and the material properties, what it's made of. And the relationship is shown over here. And just to give you a, a sense of this, if you imagine this to be a plank rather than a rod, if this is a plank, think about if you were standing on the edge of that plank, would you want the plank oriented like this? Or would you want it oriented like that? Right? If you orient the plank like this, 
the thickness, the resistance is much greater. And so we have to think about not just the shape of the thing, but the shape of the thing in the direction of the load. And what sauropods have done, I should also mention that, we have to think of these animals as not just standing still all the time, like they're posed in a museum. These animals have to move. And they move in a way, I'm showing you a table. Tables are, ta legs of tables are loaded in compression and in bending. Um, and when we pick, if we were to pick up a leg of a table, we have to keep the center of mass within the support triangle of the other three legs. But one thing to think about is you pick up a leg on a table or a leg as you move, now the load is increased. So the load that was once shared by four limbs is now shared by only three. If you take both limbs up, now you've doubled the load. And so sauropods like this barosaurus that's mounted at the American Museum must have been able to rear, I think. I shouldn't say must, very likely had to rear because most big animals have to at least mate that way. Uh, and so at some point, if some critical point in their life history, they have to do it. Um, and so they have to be up on two legs. And so these two legs have to hold up nearly all of body weight. Depends on how much the tail takes up. Maybe a tripodal type uh, arrangement. But nonetheless, these legs have to take up a lot more of the weight. And so you can imagine how they might be acting like a beam. Their turnout it turns out that there are some sauropod dinosaurs that in addition to having all this weight imposed on them may have had an even greater, uh, even more eccentric loading on their limbs because of the way that they walked. And what you're looking at in this slide are two different sets of footprints. You have to imagine the, feet, the animals walking up the screen. And so you have a left foot and a left hand, uh, sorry, a right foot and a right hand a left foot and a left hand and so on going up to screen. And you can see that there's two different types of trackways that we find in the fossil record. The one on the, on the left hand side, the so-called narrow gauge trackway, has the hands and feet placed close to the midline, so minimizing the amount of eccentric loading. On the other hand, the one on the right, which is called a wide gauge track maker, has the limbs distanced more from the midline and therefore farther from where the center of mass is. And so they should have even, an even greater bending moment placed on them. And indeed, they seem to have. And so this is what the animals that made those wide gauge trackways looked like. You're looking at, in front view at the pelvis and hind limbs of those animals. And they had uh, the, the shape of their bones was slightly, slightly different. They have kind of a different uh, orientation for their knee condyles. That's how we can recognize them. But one of the things that makes them different is that if we take a cross section through the femur, it's much more eccentric than is the average sauropod. So the average sauropod is elliptical. These are hyper elliptical. And so they're kind of more like the plank that you turn this way because the load is coming principally from over here. And so bending is in the right to left direction. It's been suggested, interestingly, that these animals here you're looking at the, the same picture I just showed you, but with, colored in a different way, the hind limb and here the forelimb. It's been suggested by looking at pictures principally that these animals had, were actually making arches out of their bones. That is, you have an arch going through here. And I remember I saw that. It, saw, it came out in 2015. I, I saw this paper and I thought, wow, I never, huh, I wonder if, wait a minute, that can't be right. How does an arch work? Well. If you think about an arch, an arch is something that takes a load from above and trans, transforms it into a compressive load that's shared in elements that are oriented in a different way. Okay? So that is, the elements in the arch, the blocks of an arch, are shaped in a particular way to make them lock together, and they pass this load compressively from one to another. That is almost the opposite of what I've been saying. And if we look at how the bones of this animal, this is an animal called Opistocelicaudia. If we look at how the, um, the bones of this animal scale, we'll see that they scale more like beams. <clears throat> because one of the things about compression, like tension, it doesn't really matter how long the thing is. Beams, however, do care about length. And so we should see for longer elements, there should be more of a... Um, uh, a moment of area associated with that. And so if we, this is a, a diagram that I thought about, maybe I shouldn't show or maybe I should. Uh, it's basically, and it's cut off a little bit, unfortunately, on this diagram. But if we look at the, uh, 
essentially the moment of area over here against the, um, the length squared, we have almost a perfect relationship, a one. The, uh, the relationship, the, the exponent is just one here. And so these bones seem to be acting just like beams. I'm going to turn this on. Another thing that sauropods do is that they have some material. Whoops, I turned the wrong one on. She told me not to do that. Sorry. Yep, let me. Did I do that right? Yeah, OK. Is that there are material property changes? I said that bone is bone, and cartilage is cartilage, and muscle is muscle. It doesn't matter who you are, um, at least to a first approximation. But the relative amounts of that can change, certainly. And one of the things that sauropods have done, this is an upper arm bone, this is, a lower, this is an upper leg bone, so the humerus and the femur, is that the ends of their bones are finished in cartilage. And so if you're close up, you can see that the end of this femur, or sorry, the end, of, yeah, the end of this humerus has a really roughened, kind of ugly bone texture to it. We think it was finished in cartilage, and so it would have extended out much farther than this. If you're looking at the screen, at that bone there, you're looking at an ankle bone, which, in, um, which has this roughened, gnarled texture that you can seal around here. This was completely enveloped in cartilage. We can estimate how much cartilage there was at some of these joints by looking at the volume of the hip socket and the volume of the femoral head. And we can see there's a lot of cartilage missing. So these animals have sort of turned over some of their limb support to cartilage because cartilage is excellent at absorbing shock and excellent at transferring a load at joints. And I told you that the one to two to many limb plan means that at every joint, you have an unequal number of elements. So you have one element meeting two here, two meeting many here. And so that cartilage helps smooth those transitions and pass the weight down much more efficiently. And some dinosaurs, some sauropods, I should say, even have gotten rid of certain segments of their limb skeleton. So you're looking at an excavation uh, in the 1940s, I think. You're looking at the, the sternum here the upper arm bone, this is a right arm, a radius and ulna, the uh, forelimb bones, and then here's the hand. There are no wrist bones in these animals. And many of these, these, these sauropods have lost wrist bones and reduced ankle bones altogether, so they've turned them over almost all to cartilage. And so they would presumably have been retained as cartilaginous elements that were there, and so they've gone away from bone and going to cartilage. So material property change. Here's something to think about, too. Um, something we can't as easily get at. I'll maybe try to convince you that we can. But living organisms, if we look at them, big animals that are gravid, portal, or columnar in posture, and animals that are cursorial, or they're fast-moving animals, move very differently. Big cats like this have an incredible amount of uh, bending that they can do in their spine. Their hind limbs go way in front of their forelimbs. They're supporting their, their entire body weight is landing on one paw. Right? So they're incredibly, if you can think back to those, some of those gymnasts we look at, they're light and they're athletic. Big animals, on the other hand, are not. I mean, elephants, no offense, Dan, but they're really not the most acrobatic animals out there. You certainly don't want to be in front of one of these animals if you're, you don't want to race one, but they can't run. They don't have an aerial phase. They can't have an aerial phase. You can push them. You can put them on an inclined plane. They won't run. Little ones, big ones, they don't do it. And so there are <clears throat> behavioral ways to get around uh, the surface area to volume ratio, by not, or surface area to volume problem, by simply not putting yourself in situations that are likely to be more dangerous. That is, keeping more of your limbs on the ground at the same time and not running. Sauropods, we don't have a record for what they did in terms of whether they could run around as much. We have a footprint record that tells us that most of the trackways show us that they were walking, they weren't running. But that doesn't mean that they couldn't. It just means we haven't have evidence of it yet. OK, I want to turn in the last few minutes here to talking. I'm going to take the opportunity to have a drink because I'm getting thirsty or getting dry, I should say. Talk about necks here. So sauropods are called long necks. The characteristic of these animals is that they have these enormously long necks. This is an animal called Omisaurus, but this is an animal that has, depending on how you count them, 17 neck vertebrae. 
you know that you have seven, right? Um, and so that's an, and not only are these <coughs> vertebrae, you know, not only there are many of them, but each one of them is quite long. And so one of the questions that I, I, I tried to ask and tried to answer early on in my career was how did sauropods do that? What were the mechanisms, the evolutionary mechanisms that allowed sauropods to get this long neck? And I can think of three different ways that animals get longer necks that we know of. One is the giraffe way. Giraffes have the same number of vertebrae that we do, but each of those vertebrae is elongate. So that's one way, shape change. Snakes have not long necks, but they have long bodies. And the reason or the way that they're able to do that is by simply making more segments. They make more vertebrae. You add them together. You, have, <clears throat> you can end up having many vertebrae by simply making, uh, having a longer body by simply making more vertebrae. These women down here, obviously sauropods didn't put coils on their necks to make their necks longer. But uh, this is an analogy here. These women, the, le the, the length of their neck is increased not by stretching anything out, not by adding tissue in between the vertebrae, but by pushing the girdles, the shoulder girdles, downwards. So essentially, exchanging neck vertebrae for trunk vertebrae. So nothing's changed other than the position of the girdles. And so that's another way, developmentally, we can think of ways to do that, where essentially we move the boundary between neck and trunk, and we can take or capture vertebrae from the trunk and make the neck longer. Sauropods... Uh, I won't show you the data, but sauropods have done all three of these things in various ways. And so if we uh, look at sauropods, you can see that they all have long necks. I'm showing you just a, a small sampling of them. They all have long necks, and they've got different, but they have different length necks with different numbers of segments in them. And if we compare... Um, Jobaria here is going off the edge of the screen, unfortunately. But if we compare Jobaria to Eoraptor, which is one of the earliest members of the sauropod or morph radiation, we can see some interesting differences in the, uh, how the, ver the regionalization of the, of the vertebral column uh, has changed. And so both Jobaria and Eoraptor have 25 vertebrae in front of their <coughs> pelvis, but in sauropods, 12 of them, the, the, the position of the boundary between the neck and the trunk, which is the pectoral girdle, has shifted backwards, and they've incorporated vertebrae into their neck from the trunk. There are more vertebrae in the sacrum in a sauropod, and the tail tends to be longer. <clears throat> Sorry, one of the things I want to mention was that it's harder to, to see now that I've turned it upside down in this incongruous way, but the... Um, you can think of the neck and indeed of the tail as being a cantilever. We know from trackways that neither of the head nor the tail was dragged along the ground as they walked. So they had to be held aloft, and so they're held aloft as cantilevers. One of the things that we do know is that the length of the skull of a sauropod scales with negative allometry to body mass. That is, if we <clears throat> For geometrically symmetrical, uh, similar organisms, we might expect a length to change as the one-third power of mass. We see that with sauropods here, we are falling below geometric similarity. So skulls are proportionately smaller for larger animals. Okay, so the load at the end of that beam is proportionally smaller. However, the, um, if we look at some characteristic height of a vertebra along with what's in front of it in terms of the load, they don't seem to scale in the same way that limbs do. They don't be, seem to be scaling exactly as beams. So the exponent on, on this is lower than one, which is what we'd expect if they're acting perfectly like a beam. And so they must be doing something else. And we can talk about the, that something else. It doesn't seem to be allometry that's uh, doing everything to make sauropods be able to hold up their necks. I don't think we can really get at behavior, but you can imagine that if you simply held your neck up vertically, you'd be in compression and be a much easier way to do it. I don't think they did that, so I don't think sauropod behavior is something that comes into play. So we're going to talk just briefly about shape and material property changes that are important. And I'm going to take the opportunity to switch, if I can, what's on the screen. So here you're looking 
at uh, a vertebra of an ancestor of sauropods. It's not a sauropod. It's something more like Eoraptor, and then a sauropod. One of the things that sauropods do to assist in creating this long cantilevered neck is that they create ball and socket articulations. And so the front of the vertebra, which is the head end, is towards the left of the screen. The front of the vertebra has a ball on it, and the back, which you can't see in lateral view, has a cup on it. The ancestors of sauropods, which did not have long cantilevered necks, had flat articulations or slightly cupped articulations. And these ball and socket articulations, this is something, a project that uh, my graduate student, John Fronimos, has been working on uh, together with me. Um, one of the things that we've learned th is that these ball and socket articulations really seem to be important, offering mobility, safe mobility, let's say, within the neck. That is, if you think about over here in the bottom left, two vertebrae in articulation, and we just attempt to translate them. That is, we take the, the neck, as it were, and move it either this way or this way. The flat or the, the non-sauropod way of articulating offers no bony obstruction to that translation. It's only soft tissues that are going to resist that translation. On the other hand, if we look at the sauropods with these ball and socket articulations, those articulations offer a bony obstruction to translation. And so they resist that translation. At the same time, if we look over at this panel, you can see that when we rotate flat articulations like that, we end up having a, a, a hinge point here and a separation there where we're separating the soft tissues and we have an impingement down here. On the other hand, the ball and socket articulations offer continuous fluid mobility. Okay, so it's a real advantage this shape change. And I said 1A because there's another part of that uh, this shape change that seems to be important too. I should note that this <clears throat> vertebra that I'm showing you here is a, um, it shows that ball and if we can turn it over, there's a socket there. So the ball and the socket in the back. I'll come back to that vertebra in just a second. Another thing that you should know is that there's a polarity to the ball and socket joints. You might think that a ball and socket joint can go either way. There's no organism that has a ball and socket joint, that I know of at least, in its hip, where the ball is on the hip and the socket is on the femur. It only goes the way that we have it with the socket here and the ball going into it. Similarly, the sauropod neck only has ball and socket articulations that go one way. That is, with the ball facing away from the body and the cup facing the body. That's the only way it's done. There's no violation to that rule in 165 million years of sauropod evolution. Why? It seems like both this and this seem to be equivalent in some way. Why are they different? This is something that John and I are still working on, but one of the things may be that when it is, has to do with where the position of the center of rotation is. It's on the vertebra with the convexity in both cases. And so on the, in the case on the left, as you rotate around, the center of rotation is on the fixed vertebra. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, when we rotate the vertebra that's farther away, the center of rotation is on that vertebra. And so what that means is that there is this other couple that we have here that we don't have in this vertebra. You can't rotate that vertebra without rotating the whole body. But this one you can rotate out of articulation away from the rest of the body. And so that seems to be maybe a disadvantage. And the reason that we only find in necks of sauropods this kind of articulation. So it's another shape change that seems to be fundamental in that sauropod stability. Another really important change is a material property change that I'll talk about. And so you're looking not at a sauropod, of course, but uh, an extant dinosaur. This is a, you're looking at ducks here. This is a lovely little uh, paddling duck. And they've taken in the panels on the right-hand side and injected latex into their respiratory tract. And so what you're looking at is a, um, a view of the air sacs that fill up the body of birds. You can imagine that replacing materials with air makes them much more light. And so I should tell you that these are not only occupying the, 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 the cavity of the lung, but they actually occupy the bones themselves. And so at bottom left here, you can see 
a cutaway view of a duck vertebra showing these large chambers within them. And so what you have left behind is sort of an architecture of bone and air inside. And so the thing is much lighter. Okay? And so this is a material property change that birds do, and it turns out Sauropods do the same darn thing. And they come from a common ancestor, so it makes sense. So here we're looking at a trunk vertebra in front view, in back view, and in side view of a sauropod called Camarasaurus. And if we take a cross section through the centrum, that through, the, through the body of that vertebra, you can see there's a porthole over here where this asterisk is. If we look at a cross section, all of this material of bone has been removed on both sides symmetrically. Some of you that are engineers will recognize that shape. We'll come back to it in a second. Um, and if we cut this way, we can see there's these two chambers inside the vertebra. And I was going to show you, if I can do it right, I have an example of not Camarasaurus, but another dinosaur called Nigerosaurus. And if we turn the vertebra this way, you can see the bottom of the vertebra here, the top of the centrum, and this median septum, which has been broken away. It goes all the way down into there. The structure that's left behind um, by pneumaticity, which removes bone, comes in kind of one or two different patterns within sauropods. The pattern I just showed you is pattern one, which is an I-beam configuration. So these vertebrae, which you can think of as the centrum of the vertebra as being kind of a cylinder, inside is an I-beam. It's resistant to bending in the up and down way. Not as much in the right to left way, but in the up and down way in these animals. There's a second pattern, which I don't have a name for. <laughs> I've called it the spongy tube. That's not a great name for it. I hope that stands up. Um, if you look at the uh, bone that I put on the screen there, you can see it's broken. It's been eroded. In life, this would have been, in a perfect fossil, this would be covered by a thin skin of bone. But you've got kind of a, a cross section that we've gotten by uh, uh, erosion, you can see all these little chambers in here. These would have been filled with air in life. And that's exactly what you see here in this pattern too. Spongy bone. I've listed here something called the ASP. ASP is the airspace proportion. So if you think of the volume of bone, or the volume that's occupied by that vertebra, how much of it is bone and how much of it is air. And so more than half air. That's a considerable savings in weight if you think about it. But it's left bone in places that, in this case, resist bending in this way. And in the case of that spongy tube, maybe are more resistant to a wider range of bending and twisting. In fact, we can measure this. This is, um, we're looking, if you recall this dwarf femur that I showed you, we have some vertebrae that go with it, and we've CT scanned them. This is an animal that remains nameless to date, but it will get a name soon. Uh, we've taken sections through the vertebra at different levels, and we can sort of uh, draw them out. And we can actually take and measure the amount. It's a tedious process. I had a student, Taryn O'Connell, who did this. Um, it's a tedious process, but you can measure the area of air, which is the white part here, and bone, which is the darker part. And in this animal, the airspace proportion depends on the slice that you look at. It differs. But it's around 79% air. It's an incredible savings on weight. So that's something important that sauropods do. And it's one of the reasons, that's not me, by the way. That's somebody else. It looks like me, but it's not me. This is Argentinosaurus. It's the largest, an, largest sauropod that we have. Its vertebrae are about 1.5 or 1.6 meters tall. And they're pneumatic. They're full of air. So they're much lighter than they would be if they were solid bone. And so these, now you're just look, I'm giving you a sense of what some of these bones would look like. Again, these are animations that were done by Adam Roundtree in our museum. And you're looking on the one hand, on the left hand side, at a, uh, a vertebra of one of those I-beam type sauropods. And so um, you, want ex you can see that porthole over here. And there's a septum. It's a very tiny septum right in the middle of the vertebra in the centrum. And then this on the right-hand side is one of the spongy tube sauropods. It's a new thing from India that um, we have in the lab. You might also notice that there is sort of an architectural look to these bones, that there are these struts that if you have a projection, like if you follow this 
projection on the end of the vertebra. That's where the ribs attach. Below that, you can see these struts that are left behind by the pneumaticity. And in fact, the neural spine, which is broken off here, has these struts that support it. The, um, the, the zygopophyses, or the articular ends, have these struts. And so there's a really complex architecture of bone left behind that sauropods have. And one of the questions, well, sorry, let me show you that in a, in a static view of Nigrosaurus. So you can see neck vertebrae going up to the head, and you can see there's these points that are supported by these laminae. And it has a very architectural look to it. And one of the questions is whether it is sort of architectural. That is, is this kind of like a bridge in some way? It's a, and I'll, I'll state at the beginning here that this is something we've just begin to get into and just begin to think about largely in response to the call to make this talk and so that's been fun. If you think about a bridge that's cantilevered here with a, a weight on one end, you can think of that as being the head. There are these compressive elements at the bottom of the bridge, right, that are loaded in, comp in compression. There are tensile elements above and then there are these struts here that are either loaded in tension or compression. Okay. So we can ask the question of whether sauropod necks are kind of like that or are really like that. And I, we can do it this way. So here's Jabaria. You're looking at cervical vertebra eight. We can put little dots on the parts that stick out farthest. Here are the zygopophyses. This is where the, this vertebra meets the one in front of it. This is the, where it meets the one behind it. And here's the rib articulation. We can make sort of a parallelogram there. We can make a parallelogram for the centrum, which would be the compressive or beam-like element in that um, bridge. And we can put them together in articulation. In the next picture I show you, this vertebra is in blue. And so if we put that all together, and this is from an actual specimen. This isn't, I mean, I've certainly simplified it by uh, making those strut diagrams rather than the actual element. But this is based on the actual animals. We see them, deformation at, and all going from the very first and, and second trunk vertebrae all the way through to the second vertebrae behind the head. And so we have these compressive elements that are below. If we add in the interspinous ligament, which is present in most, if not all, tetrapods, that join the neural spines, and these are tensile elements, we have the makings for kind of a bridge here where we have these structures that may be loaded in compression or in tension. We have compressional beam-like elements down here, and we have tensile elements above. One of the things that I think this does, this configuration does, is allows for many different um, uh, lengths and shapes of necks that allowed sauropods to do many different things. Because one of the things that I think the neck is, is it's the sort of the greatest feeding adaptation that sauropods have. And so just to sort of wrap up, sauropods were the largest animals to have walked on land. There are these challenges imposed by the square cube rule that they've overcome in various ways. In the limbs, we saw there were shape changes, there were material property changes, and there were probably behavioral changes. There didn't seem to be allometric changes, or not very many allometric changes. In the vertebral column, on the other hand, or specifically in the neck, there were material property changes and there were shape changes. We didn't see much in the way of behavior or allometry that sort of um, helped to make the neck as long as it was. Um, so there are these workarounds that sauropods used um, and obviously led them to being these exceptionally uh, successful animals in the history of life. And so with that, I'm only three minutes over. I want to thank everybody and thank you. This has been a a real pleasure for me, and um, I'd be happy to take questions and to uh, have you come up and look at some of these bones. <laughs>